Hey everyone, this is Jason Key at SB Grid in Boston, Massachusetts. Thanks for signing on today. Today we're going to be talking about uh, getting the most out of your XFIL data. So if you've got questions, you can send them uh, to me by chat and I'll pass them on to the speakers. Um, uh, if, uh, uh, we'll sort of save those to the end unless they're appropriate for the slide at hand. Um, uh, and with that, I'm going to unmute uh, you guys. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mona and Art, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we're yes, here. Yes, good Great. morning. Uh, yeah, if you could just uh, have a, just give a quick introduction to yourselves, and uh, we'll kick it off. Go ahead, Mona. Yes, yeah, so go first. Me, so Mona, um, a postdoc, currently a postdoc um, associate at, uh, with Axel Sprunger um, at Stanford University. And uh, I'm Art Nubimov. Um, I'm a research specialist also in Axel Bringer's group. Um, and together we've been collaborating on uh, computational techniques to process um, XFEL data. And uh, I'm going to go first mostly because um, I, I think in, when you are processing data with our software, you will first use IOTA and then move on to, to Prime. Um, and just as a, as a quick intro, I kind of got into all this by necessity when uh, I ended up with a very small data set, and um, which was at the time not at all useful uh, if you're a structural biologist trying to solve a structure. It was just a couple of hundred images. And so from that uh, spun out this entire project that we've been on for a couple of years, trying to squeeze out uh, useful information from small data sets. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about the, the two programs, IOTA and Prime, that uh, in conjunction well, can allow you to get um, useful data out of the minimal number of, of, of uh, requisite images. So I don't need to really uh, sing the praises of XFELs. Uh, if, if you're interested in, the talk, in this talk, you probably know that XFELs have ushered a new era in, uh, in X-ray crystallography, providing <clears throat> fast, powerful uh, laser, X-ray laser pulses at femtosecond scale which allow to carry out a process called diffraction before uh, destruction, which uh, I kind of illustrated here. Uh, this was actually a fun half hour photoshopping, a disintegrating crystal, which is what happens to it when you deliver it and it gets zapped with the uh, XFEL beam. The crystal flies apart a lot faster than, than, than is illustrated here, but um, you'd still obtain a diffraction pattern before that happens which is very useful. You can collect data very, very fast. Uh, the top rate right now is at about 120 hertz, and uh, beam lines are being built where this can go an order of magnitude or more faster. And since uh, we started on this project uh, well, four or five years ago, uh, there's been a development of a cornucopia of, of sample delivery options, ranging from liquid jets to fixed target devices to drop-on-demand acoustic injectors to um, devices that appear to defy description that I have uh, I've encountered. And um, overall, what, that, what you end up with um, when you perform any one of these um, serial crystallography experiments is a ton of hard-to-process XFIL diffraction images. Um, these are stills. They are obtained without rotating the crystal. Um, they, they are obtained from a variety of crystals. So, um, and, and this variety can go from just varying quality of diffraction to varying unit cells. Um, and th there are many of images, some of them have signals, some of them don't. So there's that variability as well. Especially if you're performing a jet experiment, you get a lot of images that have nothing on them whatsoever. So. A question that that was asked in a variety of forms uh, from the from the beginning was, "What do I do with my data?" And the next question was, "What do I do it with?" Because as there was a cornucopia of sample delivery options, types of experiments you can do, uh, and types of data you end up with. In addition to it, there is a proliferation of of packages, software packages, and 
Um, these are just these are a couple. I'm pretty sure there's even more that are being developed. The Christopher Cheetah software uh, out of um, ASU and the NXDS from Wolfgang Kopsch. But today I'll talk about to follow up on Aaron's talk from last week. If you guys heard it, it was an excellent talk that talked about the CCBX.XFL and dials as a uh, um, software of choice to um, process your data. And these kind of, when, when we talk about the software, they come in kind of three different flavors of interfaces. The one that uh, Aaron demonstrated uh, quite a bit last time, and the one that can allow you to do everything you possibly want with these uh, programs is command line and script interface. It's a super high learning curve. Um, I, I've been messing around with these programs for, for years now, and I'm pretty sure I know about 10% uh, of it. There is the CCBX that XFL GUI presented by Aaron briefly yesterday, which allows you to perform a runtime data collection and analysis. That requires an LCLS database access because it's database um, driven. And finally, what we're going to talk about today is the IOTA and Prime GUI uh, pipeline, uh, which in addition to um, being capable of running outside of the LCLS database, it just needs a stack of uh, diffraction images to start, allows to also perform optimized data processing, which I'll mention in a few minutes. The one drawback of that is that it's slow and computationally expensive because to get the most out of your data, we have to try a bunch of, uh, of things with each image. So it takes a while. So when you run, especially IOTA, um, to a lesser extent prime, make sure you have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, cores available on, on your server. <clears throat> so who should run what? Uh, somebody like Aaron. Um, is an ultra advanced user and prefers command line and scripts. Uh, like I said, they allow you to do pretty much everything. Uh, for rapid on-site data processing, should utilize CCTBX.XFL GUI. It's great, it works very well, and gives you a lot of runtime information that allows you to decide when to stop your experiment when you've had enough data. And finally, if you have difficult or limited data, that you need to process. If it's a small data set or a data set that has um, a ton of blank images and then just a few images with diffraction, um, I would say go the IOTA Prime route. Also, there is a significant overlap between these uh, uh, programs. You can do iterative uh, data processing, trying a variety of, um, of uh, a variety of options with the CCBX.XFL GUI and IOTA now, for example, has an option to, uh, to do on-site data processing in a, in a more uh, expeditious way. So what are these programs? IOTA stands for Integration Optimization Triage and Analysis. And it's a user-friendly front end, basically, for CCBX at XFL and or dials. So you can run either one of these via IOTA. IOTA itself is not a, a data processing algorithm. However, on top of that is an indexing and integration optimization uh, algorithm that allows us to get the most out of CCTBX.XFL data. And like I said, the biggest impact is for small data sets or data sets with just a few in indexable diffraction images. Once you've done this, you follow up with PRIME, which stands for post-refinement and merging, and it will scale, post-refine, and merge the integrated intensities um, for the, and, it, and it's, used for the data that's been integrated with IOTA, CCTBX, and XFIL, or dials. So this is how these programs line up. And so just to give an overview before I, I go through my little uh, demo of, of what lies under the hood a little bit. And this is going to be, uh, actually, I was going to say it's going to be a bit simplistic, but really, that's all there is to it. There is a pre-processing module to IOTA, which allows you to uh, make sure that your images can be actually processed. There's a variety of things that uh, IOTA can do. For example, you can manipulate your image. One of the problems with CCTBX.XFL is that the, the beam XY coordinate has to be located in the physical center of the diffraction image. Uh, it's an odd little quirk that's not going away uh, at any point. And so you can crop or pad your image to make sure that happens. 
um, you can actually override beam X, Y, or detector Z coordinates in case they've been incorrectly determined or incorrectly recorded in your images, which is something that happened a lot at when X files were in their infancy. And we anticipate with the establishment of more permanent uh, bio X file uh, end stations that this is going to happen less and less. Um, you can do a primitive beam stop shadow segmentation. And uh, right now, I'm a more, uh, more effective, I should say, more um, sophisticated procedures in the works to make sure your the edges of your beam stop shadow are not seen as um, diffraction spots, which happens. But there's also diffraction triage, where IOTA would perform a very kind of basic uh, spot finding. And if it doesn't find spots above a certain amount, it'll consider the image blank and discard it. And then we're proceeding to the indexing and integration. And here is the kind of business end of the IOTA program because it can perform a spot finding grid search uh, for ccbx.xfell. Well, first of all, you can choose the dials or label it, backend label it is the program uh, via the uh, spot finding grid search, which will screen different combinations of spot finding parameters, like the minimum height or intensity of, um, of a group of pixels to be considered a spot, or and actually the number of adjacent pixels that make comprise the spot, the minimal number of those. So this grid search will uh, create a number of images, uh, an, excuse me, a number of integration results from the same image. They can be filtered according to point group, unit cell dimensions, make sure that you only are selecting the best out of this filtered group of images. And then you select the best pairing for spot height and spot area by this heuristic algorithm um, that I'm not going to go into. Um, and once you've decided, or the program has decided, on the best combination of these parameters, the image is integrated, and the integration results are can then be kind of seamlessly uh, moved to, to, uh, to prime for scaling. Now, like I said, this can be filtered using a priori knowledge, and transition to prime is quite seamless these days. And then there's also an analysis uh, module where several types of analytics, uh, basic analytics can be carried out to give a structural biologist rather than a hardcore computational crystallographer some idea of what they're getting. One of the more, more important ones is the unit cell analysis, which can detect non-isomorphism in your samples. So this, this was especially critical for one of our projects where I think um, uh, two, two separate unit cells were found. And another project thing we found as many as five or six different unit cells in a single sample of a couple of hundred crystals. And that was fun. You can visualize an overlay of your um, diffraction and integration predictions to make sure nothing terrible is happening. This has become a lot less necessary in recent years, something for advanced users to contemplate. And the GUI itself, as I'll show you, will give you some runtime information about how your run is doing so you can uh, make adjustments on the fly. All right, so I'm just going to go through all these. But there's also a beam XY analysis that um, I'm not going to go into, but uh, certain patterns of the beam XY, uh, the refined beam XY coordinates over the whole data set can indicate misindexing. And we've also used this before to, uh, uh, to improve our merged data sets. So, now let's just go through a quick little demo. And I have basically a video here to make sure that nothing crashes over our Wi-Fi here. So I just, I, I performed a run and I recorded it. So I'm going to show it to you. Um, you started by just typing IOTA like this on your screen and out pops the, um, uh, the interface. You can select your uh, backend here, ccbx.xfell or dials. We're going to go with ccbx.xfell. Um, you browse. In this, in this particular case, you have to point IOTA into your data folder, as you can see here. Uh, you can select any output folders. We're going to go with whatever you started with, uh, whatever we started with here, the folder for which we ran IOTA. But you don't have to put your output there. Uh, you can give it a title. So we're going to use Lysozyme as, a, as an example. And 
one of the things that can be done to make to to make things faster if you don't know your um, if you don't know your settings that would give you the best uh, result if you need to play with things you can start with a random subset and he here I'm just going to use 150 images you can use a as few as five images um, and just see what you're getting um, I found it to be useful for enormous data sets when I just needed to quickly see if I was indexing things correctly if something needed to be changed uh, we're going to use 45 cores because those are available in the server we're running there are some import options for the for the importing of the image. For example, you can rename converted images. Uh, we're going to stick with auto, which is basically going to append my username uh, and then the numerical the images in numerical order. Um, the square image is that uh, image manipulation I referred to, where you can crop or pad your image to adjust the beam X to Y. And this is only necessary for uh, CCTBX at XML. You can threshold the beam stop or override your detector X, Y, or Z. Um, there are two different types of, tri of image triage. Um, we're going to go with a simple one, where basically you just uh, do a simple grid search or, or, or a simple spot finding. Or you can use a grid search where you try a coarse grid search of spot finding parameters and then pick the best amongst them. This is very experimental and not recommended right now. And then we're going to be a little bit more stringent with our minimal brag peaks and just go for 20, 25. So any image that does not have 25 brag peaks was going to be discarded. The processing options, the, the key here is that we have yet another, we have another settings file, the so-called target file used by ccbx.xfell um, for options. So we can, we here we're going to go with defaults and we're going to uncomment the, uh, target cell known setting and target cell centering type, which is, in this case, uh, the default is lysozyme, but you can put your own to kind of bias your uh, processing options. And then the for the spot finding grid search, there are a couple of options. There's the brute force one and a smart grid search. The brute force is basically gonna, you, you can, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, you can supply either spot height, minimum spot area parameters, and a plus minus range. For a smart grid search, it's kind of like a pseudo gradient search. We're just going to do a sequence of three by three little grid searches until you arrive at the best result. And then for image selection, we're just going to adjust that spot height. For image selection, we can um, actually, you know, you can you can apply a couple of filters. And so here we're going to use the private lattice, the unit cell filters. Again, the defaults are lysozyme so that only the integration results of lysozyme are accepted. And then the unit cell clustering is turned off by default in, um, uh, in IOTA. So we're going to turn it on here. Um, why it's turned off by default, I'm not going to go into, silly reasons. Um, but if you want to make use of this, it's good to turn it on before you start. I'm going to say OK here. And then before we run, it show you that we can actually save the script. Oops, I'm just going to call it demo1.param. Uh, so that later on, you can just load it if you want to run the same um, again. There is a preference button that allows you to choose a multiprocessing method. Multiprocessing is basically regular Python multiprocessing on the multiple cores on whatever server you're on. You can use the LSF queuing system you can, that is available at LCLS. The monitor mode, I'm not going to go into too much. If you turn that on, IOTA will just sit and wait for new images to come in, uh, be, basically be on the lookout for new, newly um, uh, collected data, which allows you to, 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 to process your data on the fly as you're collecting them. So this is uh, a recent option that was put in for the um, runtime for, for the uh, data collection. So now we're going to go ahead and run. This is the next slide. And I'm going to fast forward this one because it's actually kind of a boring uh, video because all it is, you run and this um, processing window comes up. And actually, for a, for a while, nothing happens because it only starts updating once images uh, start coming in. 
So I just point out to you that monitor button, you can turn on the monitor mode right, right here as well, um, if you want to uh, do it that way. Uh, there's a status bar that, that'll show you, a status window that'll show you how, how many images you're processing. Um, I'm just gonna fast forward here. This is what IOTA starts to look like. This is a kind of a slow process. This was 20 minutes to, to run 150 images on 45 cores. Um, so this is actually a somewhat slow process. You can see it's very slowly filling in. And here the charts on top are showing you uh, per frame the resolution of all the frames and the number of reflections with I over sigma over a threshold that you set, in this case, five, um, I over sigma five. And the dotted line is the median. So as you can see, for example, here, most of the fraction is coming in at around two-ish angstroms or better, and you're getting quite a few uh, reflections uh, per image. Uh, you can, if you look at the beam XY chart, the beam XY coordinates are refined fairly tightly around the median, which is good. And here on the, um, uh, the, the pie chart is, is showing you the kind of progress uh, in, in pale blue are the non-processed images. So far, we're about 20% in. Um, quite a few, about 20% of images so far are integrated. And then there's a small number of images that are failing indexing and integration. And this is it's just going to proceed that way until done, which looks like this. So this is how um, it looks more towards the end of the run. You can see some of the images now have failed uh, the triage step. So we're found to have no diffraction. A couple of images failed one of the filters, which means none of the integration results um, had lice design parameters in them that we were looking for. So once IOTA is done, the analysis uh, window comes on. And that's the next slide. So the analysis window has several useful uh, bits to it. For example, you can look at your overall uh, spot finding success, and uh, this will you can you can look at the minimum, maximum, and average spot finding parameters that you see there. Um, but also, you can see you can get a heat map like this that uh, shows you basically here's the spot height and area on the axes, and the the in each square is the number of successful integrations, the successfully integrated images that were best integrated with this combination of parameters. And so what we're seeing is this clustering around four or five for spot height and four or five-ish also for spot area, which is more or less what our averages are. So this is a fairly nice tight um, heat map. Sometimes you see things all over the map. Um, there's other things, for example, the beam XYZ plot which in 3D shows you um, beam X, Y, and the distance. And one of the things you can see is that quite a bit of spread for the refined um, crystal to detector distance, which would be a bit troublesome in some cases because it seems to defy the laws of physics in this particular case. So that would be something to, to kind of know about uh, your data. And then finally, uh, there's a, a run summary and a button that allows you to run prime directly with information from uh, this run populated into the prime um, files. So this is, you know, Mona is not going to demonstrate that part of it. She's going to show you how to uh, fill in things from scratch. Uh, but, but this is something that can also be done. You can run prime straight from, from uh, IOTA with all the um, parameters such as resolution, uh, pixel size, things like that already filled in. So that was kind of the uh, breakneck uh, introduction to, to IOTA. It, I hope that looks, looked fairly straightforward. Um, if you need to know more that uh, for resources, uh, there is a somewhat useful, I think, wiki page for ccbx.xfl in general, uh, as well as it has links to IOTA and Prime wikis that can, um, you know, educate you guys on the on the details of running these and i think i'm just gonna pass it on to mona yes <laughs> okay thank you art um to save time for during for our technical difficulty i'm just gonna speed up 
Um, so I'm in charge of um, developing and implementing machineries and um, tools that allow you to do post refinement for diffraction parameters and merge all refractions to get your uh, final data set that you can use to um, solve your structure. So, and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, um, how do we refine parameters in post refinement. And then we're gonna move on to how to use Prime to actually um, do post refinement and merging using GUI, um, the graphical user interface and command line um, that are both available in Prime. So, um, yeah. First of all, you kind of need to have, before running Prime, you kind of need to have integration results from um, preferably I IOTA run. So that's like when you get all the integration results together with the input parameters that is kind of ready to be used with Prime. Or if you have um, other choices like ctpx.xfail or dials, um, integration result, you can also um, start with um, um, just blank um, input prime, um, input parameters for prime, and then um, I'm going to show you how to uh, fill in some, some of these parameters that allow you to do the run and um, get your data set. So just an advanced organizer for working with prime, um, you probably want to think about three things. And the first thing is the integration results. And that's kind of like what I'm talking about here is more or less the quality of your um, integration results before feeding everything to Prime. We kind of expect to have an okay integration result. And um, in the last part, I'm going to show you how do you identify if there are problems within your um, um, your um, indexing and in integration step that might um, need you to go back and redo the integration works again before running Prime. Um, so the second one is, of course, the post refinement machinery that involves doing scaling and refining diffraction parameters. And the last one is the strategy. So whenever you um, look at the quality metrics and then you see something wrong, how do you uh, work on those problems? So um, my three examples to kind of show, will we'll show you the straightforward cases and also uh, more challenging cases. So um, uh, for the, the, the main reason why you want to do post is of course for expelled steel images is of course because the kind of intensity that you get um, from expel is different from um, expel steel images are kind of different from um, from what you get from rotation images. In case of rotation, you have um, many observation for uh, one reflection and they are usually very, very similar because this come from one crystal and um, a tire beam is very similar. The mosaicity of the crystal is the same. So whenever you see this reflection um, um, again, again, um, when you take the crystals, they are, um, of course, they are also full refractions. Um, they, uh, when you merge and average them, you get a, a, a very, very um, good high quality data set. But in case of x since everything, um, when you hit the crystals, the crystal comes at different orientation. You also get what is called a partial refraction. And that makes, again, the same refraction that appear on different x steels look very, very different. And you need a post refinement um, process to correct for partiality for those refraction um, before continue on to uh, merge your data set. So this is just one example in the case for um, even if you have only one crystal, so this is one diffraction pattern from a crystal of our synaptotactamin snare complex. And um, you can see that um, you're looking at a three free, free domains here and they should be very, very um, similar, right? The intensity, 
But if you look at the green pair, for example, you can see that this partial intensity for these two refractions is supposed to be the same uh, in the range of 4,500 um, units, intensity units difference. So that is because of the crystal orientation. That is because of now we are looking at different um, location where the evil sphere sort of overlap on the reciprocal lattice volume. So we need to be able to correct for this um, missing intensity before uh, continuing on and merge these two refractions. Um, and so again, coming back to the uh, post refinement step, you probably want to have, um, you need to have, obviously, the in indexing and integration results that um, with Tindor's result, whether it's in Pico file or any files that you have, um, inside those files, you have unit cell dimensions, you have crystal orientation, you have Miller indices, intensity, and, and the error estimates of those intensity. And the post refinement is actually a procedure that allows you to refine all these parameters using a reference set and, um, um, a patch, and partiality models that um, help you correct for the uh, partial reflections. So, in the first step, you will need to generate a reference set. And this is a set that um, basically we scale and partially correct and merge the um, initial um, the, the initial refractions based on whatever uh, parameters that you have from your integration results, just to have a starting set before you can continue on and refine other parameters. Um, so in but in a current prime version, um, what you will have as a default version is a little bit different from what is uh, presented in the eLife paper 2015. At that time, um, when we generated um, the reference set, um, the, uh, each diffraction pattern is scaled to the mean of the intensity distribution for all diffraction images. So the scenario is similar to whatever is shown here. When you have two uh, diffraction patterns, you probably want to use the same, uh, um, same distribution to scale them together. And you end up with the scenario where you probably overscale some refractions and making some refractions weaker than um, usual. So we have a new um, um, scaling method for um, as presented in our eLife paper in 2016 version. So this is the one where we kind of think a little bit of how to make the first reference set better than just scaling thing together to the mean distribution. Um, on, and when we look at the Wilson plot, and since the Wilson plot allows us to um, actually grab the initial distribution of how the intensity should look like over a different resolution range. So this allows us to really come up with um, a plot that has a fall off according to the um, contents in the asymmetric units. And um, when you have a ref uh, diffraction pattern in the UCAL can scale not just one using one scalar factor, but also using the fall off factor that allow you to collect this, uh, the slope of the um, intensity fall off so that now the intensity are kind of like um, um, uniformly distrib distributed um, according to the Wilson plot. So um, that is right now the current default version. You can still go back to the mean scale version and um, on prime wiki page, there is a, a way, uh, a set of parameters that you can set to um, switch between these two modes. The second thing I want to talk about is of course, um, how do we model our uh, partiality? And we use a spherical model. So our, the, the radius of the reciprocal lattice um, rate, um, volume is um, kind of representing different things here, like crystal mosaicity. So it's just absorbing a lot of parameters here, spectral dispersion, beam geometry, and unit cell variation. And based on that, we kind of think, okay, if the 
this spot or um, reciprocal lattice volume is being hit in the middle, then the opacity should be equal to one. Whereas if it's being hit further away from the center or from the middle, then the opacity should be smaller. And then the ratio of these two overlapping areas should um, be um, what is we, what we call a starting point for a partiality correction. Of course, you have to continue and um, do the volume correction on the top of this partiality function, and that is what we currently have in 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 prime. But I got a lot of questions after that, like will the spherical model, this radius, and everything will be able to absorb this all of these parameters in um, um, different diffraction settings and other people ask like what about ellipsoidals you know some spots are just basically elongated in one direction can prime handle that and what I would like to show you here is that um, what is the difference between the partial function for the spherical model and when you have or for when you have the ellipsoidal models and right now you're looking at a spherical model and on the right side is the uh, volume correction so partiality with volume correction for the spherical model so once this spot is elongated on the c dimensions which is a beam um, uh, direction you can see that the partiality function is actually getting flat flatter and flatter and um so that is basically the difference between um if the uh if the spot is modeled as a sphere or as an ellipsoid. So um, again, so that's the summary of the two models. And what we currently have in prime, um, the default is of course the um, Lorentzian functions. And um, prime also has two more um, analytic functions that um, allow the optimization inside to uh, um, do partially correction on different reflection types. Um, the other two are the Foyt function and the log normal function. So the Foyt function looks a little bit peakier than the Lorentzian, and the log normal look asymmetric on um, each side. So for log normal, you have you can set the um, fall off in one side of the EO sphere to be um, sharper or uh, decreased at a sharper rate than on the other side. So the Lorentzian is of course a default function, but the other two functions are um, under experiment. So you can use those two. Again, look on the wiki page, how do you set this um, partiality model function and explore a little bit and see whether the, these different functions will give you better results. So um, now I'm gonna skip over and um, talk about how to run Prime using GUI that Art kindly um, helped making um, it possible. Um, first of all, you want to open Prime program, just type in Prime, and then you, um, if, you don't, if you don't have the IOTA input parameters, you can also do it here say you lost that parameter file somehow by inputting the your uh, data uh, file or folder that have integration result and identify your output setting in job title number of residues and tell how many processor you have um, for advanced options you probably want to give it give it um, a couple more parameters um, like resolution override say 45 to 2.5 is the range that we want to um, falsify and merge the space group is um in this case it's lights of time so it's known so you can input all these parameters again these parameters you will have from um iota when you finish running iota so don't worry too much about this or how do i grab all these parameters right now so now we're ready to run um, Prime, and this is the output screen showing charts for different quality metrics. And you want to pay close attention to um, the first two, three metrics. 
So the CC1 half and the completeness and multiplicity. So to be a, a good data set, you probably want to have a CC1 half above, this is my own criteria, 75 to 80%. And you want to have completeness up to maybe beyond 90%. And with multiplicity, multiplicity in the high resolution tail better than two. Um, so that's kind of like the criteria that I have in mind, but you might get um, um, good result anyway, based on very, very stringent criteria. So um, again, you are looking at um, each um, refinement cycle. So CC1 have it's going up. But the completeness and the multiplicity are going down a little bit, but not by much, from 98.6 to 98.4. And maybe some reflections get thrown out because they are seen as outlier. Um, on the bottom right, you see uh, CC one half and other parameters for the um, different, so I'm going back, for different resolution shell different resolution shells and you can see that CC1 have a kind of okay across um, um, low from, from low resolution to, to high resolution. Completeness looks good and number of observations also looks pretty good. So um, from that we continue on and see uh, other things like I has created a really nice summary shot here. Um, you can look at these different parameters, whatever in the brackets are in for high resolution. You can look at um, charts for different metrics along different resolution shells. And um, you can see the improvement from the uh, reference set to the falsified set. And you can also save the result into table one. Um, if you go back to log, this is the um, text output log, log file that is also um, in your run folder. From, from this log file, you get more information about merging statistics. Um, something like the um, CC1 half on different crystal axes, the intensity distribution on crystal axes, and you can look at these parameters or these values in, in more detail. I'm now scrolling down to uh, trying to see for this, for example, you're looking at A star and there's something seem to be uh, wrong on A star. And in the last refinement cycle, the um, intensity on A star was kind of corrected. And now you have pretty good correlation on A star. So, um, oops. So that's it for the um, first example. Now we are at the second example where I going to try to kind of rerun things that maybe I ran two days ago and now I have pri um, prime or um, uh, yeah prime input parameter saved somewhere. I can also choose the option to actually um, from GUI to load the script. Again, Art has done this very, very nicely. So you can um, choose file and then click load script. Then you can load your script up and all the parameters are filled in. <laughs> yes, so, and then you need to correct a little bit. Now we're looking at the same data set, but we want to merge with the by four pair separated. So we want to make sure that the anomalous checkbox is checked. And again, we are um, kind of ready to, to run this. So, um, yep, the output is still the same. I'm like gonna ask Art to help me <laughs> put in the anomalous CC anomalous here um, on the screen. So, but right now we don't have that, um, but we can still look at those value in the um, log file. So I'm trying to um, sort of uh, showing you if you have, um, okay, from here you can also see if you have um, target anomalous fl um, flag set to true in this case in the prime um, field file. And in the case that you have weak anomalous um, scattering, 
and you probably want to keep your bifold uh, pair uh, merged um, in the during the intermediate cycles, and you can also set that option to to true. But in this case, we have pretty strong um, anomalous um, signal, so we want to set this option to default, which is false. Um, yep. So let me fast forward this to um, near the end, so that we can actually see the third example. Um, see again, this is a log file, and you can see that this is in the first cycle. You have about 50% anomalous signal. Um, sorry, that was the reference set. And now in the first cycle, about 58. And in the last cycle, after five cycle, you have about 70% um, anomalous signal. So that is the um, second example. And in the last example, I'm going to show you how to run prime using command line. So now we're seeing different ways how to run prime and in this example we looking at a more challenging case where we have data set that have b and c axis that b and c axis are very similar and when you work with xfail you can see that your indexing and integration sometimes don't really know the difference between these two axes and i'm going to show you how to run prime to be able to deconvolute <laughs> this um uh, mixing data set, this mixed data set. So again, look in the prime field file that I pre-generated, even though you have a very long set of parameters, but in the real run, you don't need that many parameters. In this example, you have this uh, many parameters that you need to work with. I already use this set parameters to generate um, um, the result, and we're going to skip over and look at the result. You can see that after merging this data set, um, even though CC1 half total looks okay, but if you look within resolution bin, the um, correlation is about 70, 60 percent, so not very good. And we're trying to figure out if there's something wrong. And like I told you um, earlier, um, there are the very um, the B and C. Oops. So that finally happened. I was hoping that's not going to happen. Okay, let's just skip over. Again, so, um, oops, B and C axis here are very similar. And now we're going to try to um, use the same um, field file to input a set of parameters that you will need to do to resolve this ambiguity. So um, just to let you know, if you have the normal ambiguity in terms of polar space group, for example, like P6, Prime will figure out the ambiguity it, uh, out by itself. So you don't really need to do this. But in this case, since this is a um, the case where you have B and C axis looking very similar, you're gonna need to tell Prime that the indexing ambiguity mode is false and then you need to tell prime that a side basic that um, um, can be uh, figured out using another tool in prime i can't cover that right now so but right now um, i know that the alternative basis is minus h lk so that allows the b axis to be swapped and um, with that set of parameters, you can be ready to run prime again. And I'm, I'm going to run prime using the modify parameter set and set the flag plot to true and um, starting to run. So right now we are looking at how prime calculate the R matrix. And I have to say that this is exactly the Brim and Diederik algorithm. So if you want to know how the algorithm works, um, Prime Wiki page cite this paper. So you can really go in and read how this works. But what is an extended part in between Prime is that Prime do this in the bootstrap um, manner. So it's only need um, not that many uh, frames to really figure out the, the, um, the alternative choice for that set of frames. 
Then once you merge for um, your set of frames, you can use that um, merge data set to um, resolve the ambiguity. So that's kind of like speed up the entire process. As you can see that now you run indexing ambiguity, which is an n square problem within um, seconds or minutes right now. So again, we're going to want to um, look at the uh, result. So this is the starting point of the BREM and Deodoric algorithm. You're starting with the projection of the uh, set of vectors. And at the end, you can really solve the ambiguity for this case. So you see two groups of um, frames. And we're going to need to pick only one group of frame because we give it um, um, board um, out indexing choices to the, um, in, um, during the optimization. And we're going to proceed and run the clustering algorithm. So the clustering algorithm, we'll figure it out which cluster, which is the where is the cluster, and then at the end we only need one cluster, and prime continues on, and now it knows all the um, indexing choices it need to pick, and prime will uh, merge this as a set, and continue figuring out for the rest of the frames what indexing choice should it um, be set to. So that's pretty much in the case where you um, have a little bit more challenging problem. You probably want to go back and rethinking crystallographic problem using um, 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 in Excel way. So um, there are still uh, problems in Excel that um, 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 sort that not really appear or occur in. When, when you do normal traditional um, um, singleton, when you merge for single normal traditional singleton data set. So that's pretty much it. I think Prime will continue to merge the set. And I just want to show the final result. Um, here you can see that right now we gain about almost 8 or 9% CC one half total. And the CC one half for um, all resolution shells looks very, very good now. So this is kind of ready for, for you to continue and um, solve your structure. So that's pretty much it. I have a little bit of summary here. Prime is, of course, the program to help you do post refinement and merging. And um, so if you want to continue and read more about Prime, there is a tutorial available on that website. You can just Google CCDBX Prime and um, you should um, land on the right page. Um, for that, I would like to thank, I guess with Art, Art might have a different set of collaborators, but should we, we should share similar collaborators. Our boss, of course, Axel Brunger and um, Bill Weiss and um, other lab members that kind of gave us <laughs> also the data set, right? And so we, we use the data set to learn a lot more about the glitches and problems um, for Excel. Um, Nick's group at Berkeley um, have giving us tremendous help on um, setting up the environment, feedback. Um, whenever we ask them questions, they always come back to us very quickly. Um, SSL, our CRS people, Ina Cohen, I can only mention a couple of names here, Mike Soltis um, group, um, and other people working for them, um, Phoenix people, um, Pavel, Peter, uh, Nigel and Billy Poon are uh, uh, great people behind um, the um, CCDBX module that we also use to develop our software. So um, that's pretty much it for us, I guess. Uh, do you have anything to add on the top? Um, that would be it for me as well. And I think we're ready for you guys' questions that we can take yes. together. <laughs> If there were any, can. yes. Great. Uh, yeah, Arden Mona, thank you very much. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, you can either send them to me by chat. You can send them in the chat window. Uh, it's at the bottom. You can um, 
There's a menu in the bottom right. You could raise your flag if you'd like to be unmuted and I could unmute you and you could ask your question directly. Uh, and uh, I can kick it off here. I've got a couple of questions. Um, Art, I was wondering, so the volumes of data that you're going through in uh, processing during integration uh, are fairly massive in this, in XFEL. Uh, what is that, um, are those images processed in parallel, are they processed in series so that you can carry parameters over? Do you batch them? How do you make use of you know, 45 cores at a time? And uh, where do you think, how well does that scale? Say if you could get 128 cores, would you benefit? Are there, is there a ceiling? Um, well, uh, yes, is the overall question is that we, um, uh, there's definitely capability and I, I briefly uh, uh, alluded to that when I, I showed the preferences. And this, by the way, is, is available for Prime as well, uh, where you can select uh, right now between two two uh, two choices uh, between either the you know single node multiprocessing uh, that that was demonstrated or um, make use of the queuing system. Um, right now that, that they have implemented LCLS. Um, as we are developing these, we will be adding um, new, or we'll be adding more um, submission options for a variety of different uh, uh, queuing systems that are available um, out there. One of them would be MPI. I think there was actually work on the MPI mode for IOTA, which right now is uh, not very well available. Um, but that's that's ongoing. The uh, the good thing about uh, IOTA itself is that it's basically 100% parallel. The images are um, uh, processed independent of one another. They're not batched. They're just basically queued up on as many processors as you can give it. So uh, one of the one of the possibilities that hasn't quite yet worked out yet um, that that Aaron Brewster has been uh, uh, working with is trying to use NERSC and its thousands of cores uh, to process these images in parallel. I know it right now works with um, uh, CSTBX and Dials modules on their own, and uh, one of these days we're going to get IOTA to work on that. So uh, in terms of scalability, not all the um, uh, options that are available right now, but um, I see no uh, no obstacles other than time to um, get it implemented on anything that there is. And then for Prime, I guess the 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 scalability seems if you're scaling data and you're sort of working with massive sets of merging scaling, and uh, push it. Um, it's a little, it's not an embarrassingly parallel prob problem like integrating images is, right? So do you think that there are, you were running on eight cores, it seems maybe it's not as computationally intensive to run? Um, yeah, this is, this is a very small data set, I would say, and I've worked with um, um, CSPAT, as I said, which are usually like very, very large, like 20,000 um, images before. And that's low prime down. But what prime is now equipped with is a lot of like technical things like um, C++. Um, a lot of codes have been moved to C++ using bootstrap so that you can really use machine code rather than like scripting code. Um, I'm also on to um, putting some part into GPU computing. So again, it's not like running Prime is not possible in the last data set, but nobody wants to wait, right? We, we, we want to see the data set um, right away after um, minutes or so and be able to figure out whether we're in the right path or not. Right. One other question I had that was more sort of IOTA centric was um, you've got different uh, integration backend applications. You've got CCTVX, the, the, that frame, you've got the dials. Um, are, are you planning to maintain uh, using both? Are there strengths to one over the other? Do you would you want to run both and sort of check the results against each other? Um, so right now, CSTBX and or Label it. I use those interchangeably because Label it is the back end for CSTBX. Um, is the default even though if you talk to Dials West 
folks like Nick uh, Sauter and Aaron Brewster, they'll tell you that um, CCBX is outdated. They are not actively developing any of its modules and uh, they're not really supporting it either. So hence there are some kind of arcane bits to it, like having to have your beam center in the center of the image, things like shortcuts that they haven't really ironed out and, and, and really won't anymore. The switch to dials is going apace. Uh, one of the drawbacks of that is while um, we and others have figured out various um, ways to optimize the CSTBX process, um, we haven't yet done the same for dials to that extent. So if you know how to, you know, if you are a hyper advanced dials user for stills, you can get the most out of your images. And if you're not, then uh, it, it's kind of hard to know what to optimize. So um, my suggestion kind of from a practical standpoint is um, if you're well versed in dials, then you'll have to pr provide your own options. You can use it. Um, if you have time to play around with the options, do so. Uh, but if you want something that is kind of a known quantity, is pretty stable, and um, you know, is going to give you what you need and, and can be optimized using IOTA, then CCBX is the back end to use. I also note that so far in my you know trying things side by side, um, the CCBX can. Uh, index images without any a priori unit cell information provided while dial struggles with that at the moment. Um, you know, last, as of last I heard. So basically in my own processing, I, I use CSTBX the most, um, but dials is coming along and hopefully soon we'll take over. I hope that was, I yeah. hope that, I hope that was clear. Yeah, and I've got one, one other question, which is kind of a big, so big picture, I guess, for both of you guys. And I, um, I can imagine, you know, with the XFIL data processing, sort of pushing the limits in a lot of ways, computationally, data volumes, uh, data quality, uh, sort of deriving quality reflections from lots and lots of stills uh, with multiple lattices, with lots of noise and that sort of thing. Um, where do you see, uh, could you take some of the advances you've made in some of those data processing and move them over to processing for um, conventional crystallographic data, you know, even collected in these small 0.1 degree wedges or something. I guess one thing that comes to mind for me is always this multiple lattice problem. People struggle to either fish single crystals out of, you know, the goopy precipitant that they manage to get the crystal out of, or they just can't seem to grow anything that has a single, you know, well-behaved crystal. But they've got two lattices, three lattices, uh, that seems to be a tractable problem in XFEL uh, data processing. Could do you think it could carry over? Um, absolutely. Uh, the multiple lattice uh, problem is already being addressed by Dials East, and it's so far they haven't gotten it to work quite well with stills. But actually, I think it works quite quite well with uh, synchrotron with synchrotron with, with with regular uh, um, rotational data. Um, and uh, so, so things are carrying over. Uh, one other thing kind of in between of those is the fact that synchrotron beam lines are now being adapted for uh, serial um, microsecond or nanosecond crystallography where there's enough flux to shorten the, the uh, exposures to in shuttleless mode to fractions of a second. Uh, and, and early returns from these uh, these types of experiments are showing pretty spectacular results. Um, so, in addition to yes, it, some of these things carrying over into processing of wedge data, um, the technique itself is starting to migrate and and proliferate on synchrotron beam lines as well. Um, so there is definitely a lot of cross pollination in that. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Great. Well, yeah. With that, you know, we're, uh, we're pretty much at our time. So thank you both very much for uh, two great talks combined into one. And uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in today and listening in. And you guys, I'll follow up with you offline and uh, uh, talk to you later. And, okay. Right, thank you. Right, thanks. Bye.
Bye. Bye.